something I keep thinking about, and I guess we talked about this a little bit after, and that was the other thing that wowed me was just like afterwards when people were, after afterwards, um, when people were talking about like things they learned through that reading or things that surprised them, um, questions they had. I just loved hearing that. It was like, kind of like being in the classroom, except I wasn't the teacher. Like I got to be with everybody else and sharing that experience. But um, the one thing I keep thinking about is the, um, the things people were saying about the narration portions of the play, right? Like who are we as narrators? And like, do we have identities? Um, you know, this idea of like, maybe the narrators are ghosts or maybe they're servants or maybe they're ghosts and servants or <laughs> um, maybe a combination. Um, and that was something I thought was, was really interesting and something you could keep thinking about. Like, I was like, wouldn't it be cool if maybe they were sort of collectively narrating and having this conversation. I guess I was thinking about like um, the turn of the screw we talked about, or even some of Edith Wharton's stories, like at the beginning, there's this frame narrative and it's like, let's sit down and share our stories about ghosts. And I was like, that'd be kind of cool if like somehow the narrators were doing that. Like they weren't just narrating to us as the audience, but talking to one another about like, here's the story that happened at length. Um, or here's the story of um, Bewitched. So that's something I just like keep thinking about. And I think it's a, one of the hardest things with adaptation, both with theater and film. You know, when you've got a narration heavy story, what do you do with it? Yeah, and especially in some of the stories because the narration is the thing that's actually the story in some ways. Uh, uh, hearing about what the character is thinking when you take that out and we don't know what's right. happening, the, the, how the, the, the wheels are churning, just the events aren't gonna, like, okay, that's an interesting events, but we, we never heard that this was a whole thing that a person was trying to work out in their mind. Right, right. So I think that's the sort of like, how do we make that compelling? What are the what are the possibilities for these characters? How is it engaging? And you know, they need to know like, as an actor, what are they playing? What are they trying to get somebody else to do or think? What's their objective? Um, so we're on the tightrope. We don't know. I think what we're going to end up having to do is try it a couple of different ways, mm -hmm. um, which is, you know, this is a good time to do it. We're about halfway through the process. So we've got, we've got some time and space. Um, I know I told Alyssa and Yang we would start at 740. Oh, and here's Yang Yu. Why don't we, why don't we let them in? They were conjured. It was like magic. <laughs> it was like magic. Um, let's see. Hey, um, do you all want to turn your cameras on? Oh, and Ian McNally. I conjured Ian. <laughs> <laughs> welcome, welcome, welcome. Hi, everyone. Hi. Hi. Hey. So Meg, you've already met Alyssa Coral, who's our costume designer. Yang Yu, who's our scenic designer. Ian McNally who's our sound designer and composer. And I have been talking to Meg for 45 minutes. So I'm, I'm not gonna say a whole lot, but I'm excited for you all to have a conversation about whatever you wanna talk about. I wanna hear how um, what most drew people to this project. Like, was there a particular story, one of the stories or moments within a story or Maybe something completely different. I can go first, I guess. Um, for me, and part of uh, costume design stuff, I'm always a sucker for a good period piece. So knowing that we wanted to anchor pretty period, I hadn't even read the stories yet. I'm just like, I'm game. Let's see what this material is. And yeah, how we want, I'm always interested in tying more historical elements to a more modern audience and how we can find that bridge that's going to still connect it so they don't feel, I think we talked about this in rehearsal, so they don't feel like dusty museum pieces and how we can really vitalize them while still like pulling from the past and having that historical accuracy like revitalize what story we're telling. So I'm always on the lookout for the gems of period pieces. So Kevin had it pretty easy to hook me with that one. Now I know. Pretty exactly. close. Now I know what exactly what to do. 
I think uh, when when Kevin first talked to me about this project, I was pretty interested in transform a story into a theater pieces. I was like, okay, what's, what's gonna happen? I don't know. So I think part of me joining this project is my curiosity. Is this like a, took a jump of faith, a little risk. It's like, okay, this is the, um, like the story all written about a hundred years ago and is not written for theater, how we can turn that into a theater piece. Also, Kevin been talking a lot about moment work and how he see uh, the, the tier of different theater elements. I'm pretty, I am very much appreciate his view on like the design is not the last elements of the theater. And Kevin appreciate the, the power of visual storytelling. So that is also another reason I'm very interested in the project. And later on, we like we basically basically read a whole book of the ghost story. I was pretty shocked, like how the story out written hundred years ago, and they are still applicable to nowadays to the current time. And I mean, those stories can easily be told in any time in two thousand twenty without mentioning this is like a uh, eighteen hundred pieces or this is like uh 1910 so that makes the story very interesting to up uh, to adapt to the stage on today today's environment um i guess a few things drew me to it um the first being that uh a lot of the compositions that i write are kind of based off your experience walking through a space, um, and those are often very spooky spaces. So this felt like a good opportunity to get into that. And also in the stories, I really enjoyed the potential absence of ghosts, even though they're ghost stories, they don't really have ghosts in them um, in the way that we would think about it. So I thought it was, you know, maybe from 1910, 1923, but it felt like a very fresh take on ghost stories and one that hasn't really been um, built upon by the horror or thriller genres in the same way. So that was really compelling for me. Yeah, I mean, we talked a little bit about this. By the way, I'm going on mute when I'm not talking because my cat has decided he wants his dinner. And so he's like howling, I'm gonna ignore him. Um, but you know, this is something we talked about a little bit at the rehearsal, that idea of um, not having the traditional ghost or maybe not even having any ghost at all. And I think it's interesting, the ones that have been selected. Um, I mean, Bewitched is a great example I don't know if you all want to talk about what you think happens at the end of that story, but I think it's very ambiguous. Um, and even like scholars have very disparate views on what they think goes down on like the last three or four pages. Kevin, what do you think? I'm putting you on the spot. Well, um, so my opinion, I think is probably, um, informed by those scholarly articles. So I didn't, I, I cheated a little bit and that I didn't form my own opinion. Um, uh, I think the question that I have, because it's clear, it's, it's clear someone who was living at the beginning of the story is dead at the end of the story. And like, so th and then this will be in the world of spoiler alerts. So if you don't want it spoiled, Pause. But I think um, my question is, you know, it does Mrs. Rutledge know this is a real person or does Mrs. Rutledge thinks it's a ghost? Because if she thinks it's a ghost, then we're on sort of a, a quest to stop something evil. But if she knows it's a real person, she's a murderer. Um, and she seems to, you know, uh, it, it, it clicked on us the other day when she said that last line, let's go get, uh, we're gonna go get some soap. Then I went, oh, she's gonna wash her hands clean. <gasps> oh no. 
<laughs> oh no. How about everybody else? Do you have any, do you have any thoughts? I mean, my theory of the, I, I, when I first read it, I don't really have a theory. I just being, feel like riding a roller coaster. Like there are so many things happen. There is Miss Rala doing all these crazy things. Made me feel like this lady is evil. And then there's um, footprints on the snow and there's gunshot and there's a funeral. So it's like, oh my gosh, what is happening? And the story's end, where's the ending? <laughs> so later as we talk through, and yes, I simply have a, have a compelling theory of what is really going on. And in the rehearsal, we talked about it more. I was like, okay, maybe the, they have multiple theories that all could be really happening in the story. So again, with ambiguity, Bass feel like, yeah, I have multiple theories. Uh, it could be a ghost, could not be a ghost could be a murder mystery. It's just the, the atmosphere is quite interesting. I feel like the first time I read it, I almost was more caught up in uh, how much the story almost captures the trauma at the end where you don't know what happens. And I think that ambiguity is so important. And it's so much from the narrator's perspective, who's just kind of like caught up in this moment. And it's like not what he's expecting to do with his afternoon at all. And like, I feel like I, and I definitely remember reading that, like uh, the phrases around going into the cabin being like, wait a second, I missed something. What happened here? Like all of a sudden we're at a funeral. Like, wait, a, like that is not where I thought this was going to like escalate to. Um, yeah, and having that like, oh, like these are real problems and not just like, yeah, like what happened here? And I feel like that like shock was the important piece. And then, yeah, the answer, it doesn't always matter as much as like the feeling you're getting through the writing. One thing about the story and the ending specifically that was kind of interesting is I don't know if she's lying about it being a ghost necessarily right because her husband was involved with aura um so you know her, aura's sister could be the ghost of aura in some ways so to her it's a ghost maybe that's in the scholarly articles but yeah that was just something that i was thinking about is like what is a ghost and what does ghost mean to her it's like, yeah, it's haunting her. It feels pretty ghostly and like affecting her life and what she thought she was marrying into. So it's an interesting, I hadn't thought of that before now. That's such a cool point. I love that. Just like complicating what that even means, right? To be a ghost. I, I've read this story so many times and I still don't know. It's sort of like, depending on the day, I have a different opinion. And I think it goes back to um, this question of, for me, it always goes back to Mrs. Rutledge. Like, what is her motive? Like, why is she, does she know? Does she not know? Does she think it's a ghost? Does she not think it's a ghost? I mean, I guess it's the questions that Kevin um, was posing. And depending on how you answer that question or those questions, you have a very different reading of the ending. Um, but I love your point, Alyssa, too, about like, it's more about the, the feeling that it creates for the viewer. Um, and then sort of getting to, um, create their own understanding of what they think happens. And it might be one thing for one person and the person sitting next to them, it might be very different. Um, and then to Young, your, young, your point about atmosphere. Um, and I mean, for all, all of you, you're gonna have so much fun creating atmosphere through sound design and the costumes and the set design, the lighting, oh my gosh, I'm envious. Speaking of speaking of the design, do you do you all have um, design questions you want to ask Meg, or design things you just want to talk about? Well, I I had the question that I posed um, at rehearsal on, on Saturday. If you've brainstormed that anymore since, I have. I came up with a whole like list of things because I was like I know Ian's gonna ask again <laughs> or if he doesn't I need to be question ready. what what were you all talking about do you do you want to explain Ian or do you want me to um you will probably word it better than I will because um I can't remember the exact essence of my question so I mean I think just basically you were asking um 
know, is there something you could watch, right? Horror films you could watch that might inspire you in terms of the sound design. And, um, it was interesting. And I, I said this when you first asked too, when I was coming up with this, my little, it's actually kind of a long list. I was like making all these notes. Um, it's interesting. Like I think of this, the stories as being so quiet, right? This is what I said to you at the time. Like they seem so suffused with silence. Um, and partly that's because of the settings, right? These are all very isolated settings, um, mostly rural settings. But I also think silence is a theme in a lot of the stories, like um, the lack of communication between the husband and wife and afterward um, and bewitched, like these people are all super repressed, like nobody's really talking. It's not like Mrs. Rutledge is going to say like, we're having some problems in our marriage, Saul, like let's talk it out. Or, I mean, this is a, a marriage that's um, defined in some ways by silence. So when I think of the sound design, I just think of quiet. Um, but then I was thinking about that and like a couple um, things that came to mind. So the first is a film I don't particularly love, um, A Quiet Place, but I do think it has a really interesting sound design, right? Because, you know, the whole premise is based on the characters not being allowed to make or not wanting to make sound, right? Because that's going to um, make them a target. Um, but I think there's some interesting things done in that film with uh, sound. And then a couple films I thought about that are very quiet, horror films this is, they're very quiet, but there's a really strategic use of music occasionally were um, Halloween and Rosemary's Baby. Both of those, like, I mean, Halloween, I, I have to go back and watch Halloween, the first one again, but, you know, there's that theme that plays, the Carpenter theme that plays, but, um, in my mind, at least, it's used very sparingly. And there are just like whole scenes where it's just diegetic sound being used. Um, so those came to mind. And then the other thing I thought of was, have you seen, I don't know if anyone's seen It Follows? Yes, and Kevin definitely has seen It Follows. Oh, okay, yay! It Follows is one of my favorite horror movies and my favorite scores for a horror movie. Oh, good. Me too. I love it. Um, and I was like, okay, the music itself is not very Wharton to me. Like Edith Wharton and synthesizers don't really seem to go together for me. Um, but I love the way that, I can't remember the artist, it's like disaster piece who did that score, but there's like the way that he like builds, it. like, like there are often just these like noises, like, um, they're trying to show the character's interiority and then they kind of like build an intensity while the action is building. And I was like, something like that could be really cool. Like any kind of sound or noise where you're trying to show what the character's feeling or experiencing, even if it's just like static or something, I don't know. So those were the ones that came to mind. Then I just started writing down like tons of horror films. And then I was like, oh, Sound of Metal. It's not a horror film, but it does that thing of like trying to show you how the character is experiencing things. I'm like a little bit awesome. nerding out on um, sound design. Sound of Metal is a great it's example awesome. for that. Yeah. Yeah. Cause I found that film so disquieting. Yeah. yeah. Well, um, I think it's also interesting what, what you're saying is it's, it's like, what is the function of the sound? What is this, how is the sound contributing to the dramatic moment rather than underscoring the, the moment? Is that? Yeah, exactly. Ian, you were gonna say something too. Oh, I was gonna say, it's also interesting that you bring up the sound of metal because the thing that I keep coming back to in terms of sounds that aren't synthesizers but are ominous and sustained are um, cymbal overtones, which you can record. Um, so, cause you know, they, they obviously play a really big part in that film. So that's, yeah. It's cool. It's yeah. Thanks so much. Those are all awesome. And I'm excited to watch them again now. Sure. And then the others too, you had mentioned the others, but that I can't really remember the sound design, but just the feel of that movie, it feels like it could be an Edith Wharton story to me. I don't know. 
Uh, I was just going to say one thing that I've been puzzling over is how to have these stories have really distinct feelings in costumes, even though it's the same actors for a lot of it and we really don't have time to change very much. And I think a lot of that will probably be a double up with some of our other designers helping change mood as we move through. Um, but that's something I've definitely been playing with and I'm interested, I don't know, if you have a sense of kind of what you would identify as like different elements for each of the four stories of being like what you feel like is the most important thing to come through of what it should feel like. I don't know if that's a clear question or not. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, I, I'm going to ask a question back yeah. for you and maybe for Kevin too. Have you determined when the stories are set? We've talked about it, but I don't know if we've necessarily like locked all of them down and a lot of them are ambiguous about when they are so I don't know if you have uh information of when you think they are I definitely have ideas for some of them and some feel like very much yeah at certain points but a lot of them are set as you said before in such remote areas that it's almost this like back in time feel that it's like how much of that is the location versus how much of that is the actual time period it's taking place in I've been quite confused and haven't been such a great uh, resource on, on that. So, because um, there are ones like afterward is clearly written or, or set, I'm assuming sometime around the Titanic because it's about technology and things, things happening that would involve technology that, that would be around at that time. Um, but Miss Mary Pask, I can't, I can't tell when that happens. I can't tell what the time period of that is. Um, Bewitched, I can't quite tell when the, it feels like it's before 1920, but I don't know. And the eyes, it also sort of feels like, I think it's early 20th century, but I don't know. So I'm, I'm also curious to hear from you what you think. Yeah. I mean, I don't know either. <laughs> I, have, I have no special insight. I mean, I think they're deliberately ambiguous about the time frame. Um, which I don't think is necessarily a bad thing. I mean, it goes back to what Young was saying about the timelessness of these stories. Like you could take one of these stories and set it in the present day. So, um, or maybe not all, but which might be a little bit hard, um, but you know, you could do something like afterward in, in 2021. Um, so I guess that's why I was just curious if you had thought about like, ooh, maybe we'll set one in like, I don't know, 1993 or something like wildly different um or if you're kind of sticking to the 1910s 1920s I think my preference I mean we haven't made a final decision my preference has to relates to something around can we leave our can we leave our world behind and anything close to our world can we leave it behind for for right now um just because right now for me has been quite intense for, for quite some time. So I'd like to get, especially give the, our audience an opportunity to have something that there's some distance between, although I think there will be some very direct resonances to our right now. Um, there's a lot of uh, characters or scenarios where somebody is sick with something. Sickness seems to be a thread. But I don't know, we haven't, we, we haven't really had that conversation about would we costume it in the 90s or? Well, Alyssa is going to be like, forget it. No, I, I signed on for the period piece. Costume it. <laughs> Kevin's like, oh, now I know what I'm going to keep. But yeah, I think um, in kind of our initial conversations, we have talked about what it is about the eras they're set in initially that's like having that resonance. And I do think just for our continuity of storytelling, we're gonna to have to have some similarities between our periods. It's gonna be hard to have really distinct shifts, just the practicality of doing quick changes backstage, which it can be done, but, and then it's like, I do think there's something interesting about it, almost this group of storytellers and narration is such a theme. So I think having that kind of linger through, I think having some continuity in the costumes will help with that story and kind of establish what our rules are in our storytelling that then help the audience move through that without having too many jarring changes of that. And I think we're gonna have enough excitement within the stories themselves that I don't think we need to have the like harsh flipping between worlds of costumes. But that being said, we do want them to feel distinct. So that's, yeah, definitely my current uh, challenge I've been thinking about and exploring. Yeah, so I haven't helped you with your question because I, I just asked the question and then um, 
Yeah, because I was thinking like even if they were slightly different time frames, you might be able to do something like obviously a story set in 1920s, you know, the characters are going to be wearing a particular kind of yeah. costume versus like Bewitched, which again to me feels older. I don't know why that always feels more like a or very early 20th century story or maybe could even be earlier than that. Um, so what there's some almost with the like witch vibes of the witch just and like with it, it does have and with like old new england it does kind of have a feeling of an older story versus and i think it's important in with the four of them to kind of figure out what the different beats are of where and even the ones that are more like the rural setting um of like miss mary pask feels so important in that isolation of that versus like the eyes which are going to have much more of like an urban society feel and like much more higher class. So maybe some of it's class versus the different time periods. But I do think yeah, it's having what's going to pop each story a little bit differently. Yeah, I think but it's good to know that there aren't any glaring uh, nods to specific time periods that's gone over my head. So then that gives us the freedom to decide where we want to anchor them. Yeah. Yeah, I think you're answering your question. There are, thing, there are, little, there are things you can do, right? Um, also, just you, you mentioning the the rural settings versus the urban settings. Um, that was something else I meant to uh, say to Ian or, or just bring up to Ian that the, a lot of the natural settings feel kind of sinister. So there could be something to do with that too. Like I'm thinking Miss Mary Pask and like there's a wind and like he can hear the ocean in the background and that's like producing this atmosphere. Um, so that's another thing to think about. I'm curious, um, in terms of um, scenic design, architecture was a big part of Edith Horton's life. Do you have any um, thoughts or suggestions around, it seems like she's, whenever there is architecture in the story, it's really important. Yeah, I mean, Edith Horton, um, very interested in architecture and interior design. She um, has a whole book on garden design. She helped design the Mount, the place that she lived in, um, in Massachusetts for about 10 years. So she was always thinking about these things. And I think, you know, I would say it's sort of as like what I was saying um, when I was talking to Ian about like sort of using the sound design to project something about the character's interiority, I think you could do something similar with the set design. I mean, you see this all the time in films, right? You know, the, the space that a character occupies, especially their, their personal space, like their bedroom or their living room, um, can tell you so much about those characters. So there could be interesting sort of ways that you, that you use the set design to symbolize um, or even build character for sure. But I have like zero experience in set design. I feel like I can kind of talk about sound because I like teach film, but oh gosh, set design, I've got uh, nothing. Just for creating this um, horror suspense atmosphere and uh, and also this is the story, uh, this is all the Edith Warden story. And you also mentioned she's very interested in interior design. Um, so in this, you know, the time period, the style, which one or generally which category you think would be better to create this in worth and one style's horror atmosphere? I mean, I think there it's, it's, a, it's gonna largely depend on when you're setting the stories, right? Um, and I would say maybe, I mean, Edith Wharton had a very particular taste um, her first book was about interior design, and she was very much about a classical, clean look, very balanced look. So like if you're trying to um, make sets based on her aesthetic taste and her aesthetic principles, I would go very classical. Um, but then that is different from maybe trying to, like I was saying before, use the sets to tell us something about character. Right, I mean, think of Mrs. Rutledge, for example, I don't know that she's gonna have her like perfectly appointed classical, <laughs> classically interior design home, right? I mean, that's gonna be a, a different sort of story. So I think a lot of it depends on um, what approach you wanna take. And again, on when the stories are going to be set. Sort of the same answer for, for Alyssa too. And is there any film or TV you're recommending like have a similar atmosphere? 
fear you feel like with the Edith Wharton story? Um, well, for Edith Wharton's own personal look and style, I would definitely watch um, Martin Scorsese's The Age of Innocence. Um, he did so much historical research on, uh, you know, New York society in that era and a lot of the costuming, Also, you might be interested to uh, period piece, um, the costuming and he even a lot of the objects that are used, um, uh, prop, props, um, the decor are actual objects from that era. And I think they do really reflect her aesthetic taste. So that could be something to check out. Are there sections of the Age of Innocence where they're showing the opposite of her aesthetic taste? Like I know there's there's something in her writing where she talks about something about getting rid of all the junk and the clutter of the Victorian sort of look. Like when they go to Mrs. Is it Mrs. Mingott's house where there's like all this stuff in there? But then they go to other, I'm trying to think of who else's house they go to where it's very, is it the Archer's house maybe? I mean, the Archer's house, in my, I haven't seen the movie in a while, but in my mind, that's the more the old school classical tradition. And then Mrs. Mingott is like, yeah, she's got her like overstuffed um, drawing room with like lots of furniture and stuff. And she's also just very unconventional because she like lives above Central Park and that's the boonies. Um, but I, I feel like there is something with... Um, the characters who are sort of upstarts in the society, new money, right? That they have this kind of garish taste. Um, yeah, that movie I think would be great to watch because she's sort of um, showing lots of different sets within a you know fairly um, unified class, right? Upper class society, but there are lots of differences within that, like old money, new money, um, really keeping up appearances versus not giving a crap like Mrs. Mingott. Um, so yeah, I would, I would definitely give that one a watch, even though it's not a ghost story, right? Um, it can, you know, it's still, it's, I mean, that's like Edith Wharton's most Edith Wharton novel, perhaps. Thank you so much. This was so great. Um, really insightful and helpful. Yeah, just thanks. Thank you. You're so welcome. Thank you for being here. I love, I, anytime you want to talk about sound design, I'm in. Great, because I love it. Thank you. <laughs> thank you all so much. Uh, thank you. This is great. I so nice to see you. Bye.